Good morning. Here we are back for another another great opportunity to learn, to listen, to grow. Uh, I'm Maurice Schneider, your host here at Transcending Stuttering, and today with the real Irishman, um, Stephen Green, and that's Stephen with a PH. Uh, I made that mistake once somewhere across the way. I've got many friends, Stephen, Stefan, Steve, Steve, Steph. In America, we're going through the playoffs right now in basketball. And of course there's Steph Curry, but don't forget about Seth Curry. Now with all due respect, their dad, Del Curry, is an announcer and a former NBA player. What were they thinking? Naming two brothers, Steph and Seth. Even if the audience and the fans get it right, like you're just, I think people should try to start kids' names with different completely different sounding things. Getting it too close is just a bad idea, but it's great to have you, Mr. Green. And uh, sure. I'm glad that, uh, like if it was St. Patty's Day, it would be really good to be with <laughs> you and Green that we like the complete effect, but he's a, a red bearded Irishman, but there's much sure. more to it. There's much more to it. At first glance, uh, I was intimidated man to man. He's got the, he's got the full on thick beard he's got the tattoo he's got the hair just so he's going back to the gym to pump iron and let me tell you the other side of this guy his bio is so so humble uh he's a person who stutters from dublin ireland he's a social care worker of 20 years of experience working in the area of intellectual disabilities he's the former chairman of the irish stammering association and a support group facilitator He's also married with one daughter and he plays keyboard in a band. He has dogs, um, enjoys getting outdoors and we connected recently. He kind of reemerged in, in the online space of the stuttering community and we connected uh, over some things we were both concerned about. And then we discovered we had things we were excited about and I just love his positivity. I love his strength. I love his generosity. It's an honor and a privilege to jump across the pond and have uh, Stephen Green joining us today. Thank you for the uh, introduction there, Yuri. It was very good. Um, yeah, there's very little I can add to the introduction there. Just to say that uh, thanks for the opportunity uh, to just come online and to just talk about stuttering, uh, the issues maybe my own journey and uh, just where I'm at now as well. So, sure. Well, I noticed that when you posted this up, one of our mutual friends in the UK, Ram, uh, Stuttering Mind, he said, oh, it's great, man. And why don't you do your own podcast? And I would just second that, you know, I think uh, you are a man with perspective and wisdom and a lot of people enjoy listening. So I hope this is the first of many, either that we support you and host you and just give you the mic or consider it. You know, I think it's a great vehicle and uh, you have a lot of wisdom to share. So I'm looking forward to this uh, meandering conversation that will certainly leave us wiser and more in touch and more understanding. I'll share uh, a lead in story. Oh, you know what? Let's kick it off like we always do. What's one thing that you'd like people to know that wasn't in the bio? One thing about you that you feel proud of or an important piece of you that you'd wish to share with people? Um, okay, one thing was, I suppose it's my curiosity for people. I just, I just love uh, meeting people, getting to know like different cultures, um, just people that I haven't met previously and maybe different cultures that I uh, wouldn't have had that I wouldn't have known much uh, about and just just getting to know people and just the interaction with them and because uh, I personally I'm I love to talk to people and, and, and I love to find out just uh, different people and stories stories of the life and maybe some similar similarity Allergies then that we have as people then as well, uh, even though we are probably from different parts of the world totally, but then uh, we can associate on so many levels, like whether it be family, whether it be um, different 
interest that we have like so yeah so that's maybe something that i didn't have in the bio so yeah you left out that you traveled the world and have worked and spent extended periods of time and i think that's such a complementary thing to being you know living a fuller life you can stay local and live close to where you grew up and and have a very wonderful life not necessarily live in the epicenter of culture and action and business but getting out of your hamlet and getting to know other cultures and the beauty that exists outside of what's familiar and most importantly how much we have in common how much overlap there is to the human experience no matter what language creed you know color religion whatever that's so says a lot about you yeah. um but also you and because it was 2018 uh, when myself and my wife decided to take the year off work uh, because like we've been working in services for like a long time and the two of us said look it'd be good to just take a step outside of work now and head off and do a bit of traveling and just see some of the world then as well um and i really like even that traveling experience it really reinforced um, the belief that I have that people are innately good, like, you know, then that there's a goodness just to a people. And that traveling just um, really showed me uh, that goodness that I could see. So I'm coming up with all kinds of um, warm feelings. But I also want to give a shout out to my favorite other Irish friends. Um, Michael O'Shea gave me one of my favorite um, signed books, Why I Call My Sister Harry. Um, an amazing, amazing book. Um, I'm a deep good friend, uh, Michael Ryan and others. And of course, one of my favorites, I know that you told me when we misspelled your name, um, every mother wants to see their son's name spelled right. So it made me think of my other favorite Irish woman. Mm. I'd be careful here. My other favorite Irish woman is uh, Joe Biden's mom. He describes his mom as uh, a short Irish Catholic woman. And there's an amazing story of what she did when a nun teacher uh, mocked his stuttering in class. And if you want to see that, you can go online, you can search for AIS. Um, Joe Biden gala speech. It's also on a, a blog post that we put together. We put that video in there. It's a two, you got to watch two videos to catch the whole story. But if you go to our website, schneiderspeech.com, you go to the blog page and search for stuttering paradox Biden. Uh, we've got those videos there. It's an amazing story. So I picture your mom as that strong, uh, feisty image that I have, which might be right or might be wrong, but at least she's going to be feisty about the spelling of your name. So Glad we got that right. <laughs> yeah, no, I can definitely say that my my mother is um, actually one of our favorite sayings that she has for me is um, especially when I'm in conversation with her, she will always turn around and say, "But seriously, son, but seriously." So if we're talking about stuff and I am trying to make a point, she'd be like, eh, "But seriously, son." So yeah, she is. Uh, she is a very strong Irish woman anyways. Well, that would be a great segue into perhaps the first thing, which was the most recent thing we chatted about, um, being strong, right? She's strong, you look strong, you're a man's man. I said how some might look at you and be intimidated. Um, so I was interested if you wanna share a little bit about um, your experience as a man's man uh, and Irish and whatever that means culturally, um, and how that's been a part of your journey, and then also what are some of the some of the um, misnomers, misgivings that that people have in their minds of either the identity they carry themselves, they don't allow themselves to follow their real identity because they feel they have to live through this shadow identity of what they think they should be, or places where they bump into this, where people have cast them as such and such, and such and such people don't do that, but you wanna do that. So maybe you could share on that. I think that's a really interesting thing for a lot of guys out there who might, you know, hey, therapy's not for me, or hey, I shouldn't be so tough on myself because a man would just toughen up, or that's what I see other men do on TV or something, I don't know. 
Oh yeah, totally. And and what I would say is it's never to judge a book by its cover as well, because like, uh, okay, maybe you might look at me and you see this kind of crazy. Like, now I don't particularly see myself as as a kind of tough guy or any of that, but um, so I've been working with people with intellectual disabilities for 20 odd years and it's a passion that I still have even after working for all of that time and and doing that work it's all about being able to put yourself in the position of the person that you're working with then so like um how would you want to be treated if you had somebody that was looking after you so it's always put yourself in the role of the uh, other person um and i think my and i think my stuttering has really helped me in that regard to just really to empathize to just really empathize with maybe uh, struggles that different people have then so whether it be somebody could be somebody that's on their autistic spectrum and they are finding it very hard to communicate their own needs um, and then people maybe aren't necessarily uh, listening either so um, as a person who stutters I could identify with that struggle to communicate and to kind of fit into, so to fit into a fluent world, whereas I can understand somebody that would be on the spectrum is trying to fit into this other world then, and um, and just the difficulty that is around that. So I think definitely just bringing it back to my stuttering that that has really helped me in many aspects of of uh, my life also and I suppose bringing it back to your question about just being a man and living and going through the different stages of life as well the most important thing is to be able to show your true or or authentic self so it's uh, Number one, to be comfortable in your own skin is uh, very important because I think if you're comfortable in your own skin, you can, you will give off this air of, and I don't think it's necessarily confidence, but it's an uh, air then that you're okay with yourself, you know, and and I think people kind of feed off that then also, you know. So I think that's very important for a person to be able, especially a person maybe who who has gone through maybe a challenge on stuttering, to be able to show their true self and just try and get away from the holding back and maybe the avoidance behaviors that we would have done in in the past. Like so I think it's all about just um not holding back and kind of moving forward and being able to show your true self. So if you understand what I'm getting at there, you know. Totally. In America, there's a phrase, you know, showing your true colors. So I feel like your true colors are the redness of your beard. But yeah, <laughs> letting your letting your true self out, letting, <laughs> you know, letting it be. And yeah, love it. Yeah. And, uh, and I suppose it's, it's just taking into account maybe the different pressures that people have through the different stages of their life. So maybe uh, your teenagers is that you're trying to fit in. So you are uh, trying to fit in with a group or you're trying to fit in with a, um, just a certain group of people. So the last thing that maybe you want to do is to be uh, openly show, 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 show your stuttering. So it's taken into account um, different stages and where people are at, at 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 them stages, like you know. So and it's and it's just trying to find out uh, like what works best then, anyway. So. 
so important. And I think that's a great little hat tip to stages of change. Uh, we discussed a lot with Dr. Naomi Rogers in an earlier episode, and there's so much there. Speaking of that, do you want to take us for, I know you, you shared it as one of the bullet points we might touch on a little, a little journey of, of your growing up and your own relationship with yourself, with your stutter and how it was dealt with and how that's evolved over time in different stages of your journey. Yeah, so um, basically I would have gone through therapy um, at three different stages of my life. So the first stage would have been when I was about five or six years old. And I have very little memory of of that therapy. Um, the only memory that really stood out in my mind was that going to the therapist and and my mother had to stay outside while while I went in to see the therapist. So actually that was just the memory that really stood out in um, in my mind just in relation to that first experience of uh, speech therapy. Um, How old were you? I was about five or six years old. So this would have been, so it would have been, I can't think that one, two, three. So it would have been about um, 1978, 79, probably would have been the year anyway, so, yeah. And would you have preferred she be in the room or like, what did that feel like as a kid? I think that's an interesting one. A lot of times, a lot of people's experiences until today, you know, the kid goes in, the parent does the drop off, either they sit in the waiting room or they go do errands, you know, in hindsight, was that, was that more easy to kind of be in there alone? Or was it something you would have wished it was like a surprise to you? I'm just curious. Yeah. It was, well, just speaking from my own experience, I think I probably would have added having my mother in there. I think uh, it's, I just felt the separation there and and I think also so everything just happened in the therapist office so there was nothing that really happened back in the house uh, so so um so there wasn't really like a rollover of that therapy I think which is very important now I think so that you can have a um when it comes to therapy then because a lot of the time is when the child is at home and so on. So maybe that's when uh, parents maybe should be given the right direction then as well. Anyway, so. My father always says, you know, the five-year-old child who stutters did not do their research, make the phone call and schedule the appointment. You know, <laughs> they, they certainly, it's their stutter and they deserve to be treated with the dignity and humanity, even as a young person. <clears throat> But the mistake of not seeing the parent as such an important stakeholder and not treating them as such, meaning, it, you know, mm. nothing critical here, just a tip or a thought of forward thinking. The parent is also holding a bit of the stutter and, and hoping and wondering how to help the young person in the best way possible, not to do anything that could be harmful. And on the other hand, they don't want to sit idly by and miss the opportunity to do something that could be supportive. And so the importance of engaging parents and, and certainly they didn't reach out to sit in the waiting room and not be engaged. Not that that's what happened there, but yeah. as a best practice, finding ways to engage the whole family is so important. Definitely, yeah. I'll, share, I'll share one story. It'll might bring you into your junior high years. Um, mm -hmm. Had a call earlier this week, a junior high girl, very confident and mom is there and it's on Zoom. And, and the girl says, uh, you know, I really found it really hard this week, like never before reading so then they went on and said uh, uh we start with a highlight this time they started with a with a problem but then shifted into the highlight she she knows i like the focus first on the wins and also on the challenges so the challenge was that the wins were that in other situations speaking more freely and feeling more agency and both in taking risks and, and talking and speaking up more and also feeling that she had a handle on stuttering and being able to get her words out in a way that felt like a good balance of she could do something about it it was less effortful less distracting um still stuttering but feeling really good about that but reading was really oof. so the episode that she shares is that she's in the car with her mom her mom's driving rightfully so gets a text message says can you read me the text 
she's holding the cell phone and it's quiet because she's having a block. And mom says, and child says, um, oh, it's because I stutter. And I always stutter when I read because that's what's happening this week. So, so then they were gonna move on with the situation, but mom and child are there. And I said, well, I wonder what you would have liked to hear. And child, daughter says, I don't know. And I said, well, let's just brainstorm. Like if we could go back to that moment and um, we started to throw out some ideas. So mom said, well, maybe it's awkward and you just want me to ignore it. Maybe that would be the best thing. Just ignore it. It's, it would be more awkward to even talk about it. Just kind of like let it go. Another option would be, come on, come on, you could do it. Use the techniques, use those tips and tricks. And um, child says, no, I wouldn't want them to ignore it. I, wouldn't want them. I said, well, you think there's a third way? No, it's just those two and they both stink. I'm like, no, there's always a third way, come on. And so I put out there, I said, well, I don't know, something crazy like, oh, oh, I didn't know. I'm, I'm, I didn't realize it was hard to do that. Um, I can read it for myself when we get to the next uh, place to stop. Child's like, yes, that. And to the parent, it was so foreign to just be able to acknowledge and hold and the parent starts running into school and, and, and I said, just, we're just talking about that as one context and in different places, the child may choose differently. But this is one place where we could just go back and play the tape again and give agency to the young person, help the parent hear different options because the parent doesn't wanna make it awkward. They wanna help the child, it's coming from a loving place. But the child is saying, neither of those are desirable. This is what I want, the third one which takes a lot for parents. I just want to emphasize as a parent and you know, you're a parent, it's hard to just hold a kid who's bleeding. It's hard to just comfort them and not run to get the best of Tracen and the this and then call the doctor and, and, and go to the hospital just to be extra careful. But that creates panic and worry and angst for the child. We mean the best. It's much harder to say, okay, right now we need to get a tourniquet if necessary. We need to you know, clean the wound if necessary, but then just, just hold and be in that place. So I'm just sharing that as a segue yeah. into, I wonder what junior high and high school was like for you, but I think that's a valuable yeah. story. Yeah, no, uh, definitely. I can definitely see the value there, Yuri. And it's just being able for the parent and the kid to just have that space. It's uh, a vital really anyway. Um, my own experience, like school was pretty good. I had really good mates um, and I never really, I was never really bullied or any of them things just during school. But I did, reading was a difficulty for me. And I used to have teachers that would skip me because they knew that I struggled with my speech. And I felt the relief at at the time but it was short-lived because it would it would add to the guilt it would add to the shame that i felt maybe after that like you know but i had this one teacher and i think i was 16 at the time and I had this one teacher that always kept asking me just to read and and he said it to me then he uh, said look Stephen, I will continue to ask you to read because, because I don't want to treat you any different than any of the other students here. Um, I can see you're having difficulty with your speech, but um, I, I hope that you don't mind if I continue to ask you just to read. And, and I felt so, even though uh, the reading was difficult, I was blocking, I was getting the repetitions, I was struggling for air at times and, but I was happy that I did it, like, you know, um, I was happy that I wasn't passed over. And, and this same teacher actually had, he had a friend that uh, worked as a speech language therapist in Trinity College. And he was able to get me um, to be seen by one of the therapists there. So, so um, he got in touch with my mother and he asked, would it be okay um, 
if he could arrange uh, some therapy options just for myself. So I went as a teenager. Um, now, looking back on it now, I don't think, number one, I don't think I was, I was ready for it anyway. It, it just wasn't, just wasn't at the right time in my life for me. And also maybe just what I was doing as well, just it didn't really totally sit totally righteous with me because we would have been doing like fluency shaping. Um, so we would have done the like slowed speech and just having, um, I remember the therapist used to give me the, uh, the practice tapes for the slowed speech. And then she said, no, even make sure that you practice. And I would, I would leave them, I would leave the tapes in the bag or he wouldn't be doing my practice at all. And I'd be turning up at the, be turning up at the clinic, still turning like a mad thing, um, the following, like the following session anyway. So, but looking back on it now, it just, just wasn't maybe at the right time for me to do therapy then anyway. Uh, but it was funny because I remember the first ever session that I went to uh, in Trinity College was, so Trinity College is kind of right in the middle of Dublin city. And uh, really, it was on a really uh, busy road. And I had, now, I just thought I could go up, open the door and walk in. So I went up to open the door and, and the door was locked. And next thing I saw this intercom on the side of the door. And it must have took me about like 10, 15 minutes of walking up and down the street, building myself up to press this button on the intercom. So I pressed the button on the intercom, um, tried to make a sound. I blocked on the first syllable. I could hear all of the traffic just in behind me, the buses and everything were flying past. And I felt I was stuck in that stuttering block for um, ages. But it was obviously just a short period of time. But uh, yeah, and that was just to get into the building anyway. So <laughs> you'd think they'd have a little bit more <clears throat> empathy. Uh, you got people with communication challenges using an intercom as the gateway is a bit harsh. Yeah. You know, I think well, creating maybe... ramps of access, you, you wouldn't yeah. put like a steep staircase in a place where people have uh, challenges of mobility. You know, the whole idea is creating ramps of access. I, I'm glad that we are in an age where you could use a finger to identify yourself or some other, you know, text message. But that's that's rough showing up for your day of speech therapy and you've got to use an intercom from a loud street. That's yeah, yeah. Quite so, an image. Tough. So what so happened yeah, so, when you got in? Um when I got in, I I met this lady, um I think she was the head of the department at the time. I actually thought she was quite scary. <laughs> I just, I just, um, I just met this lady, and then she had this like mad hair. The hair was like, like you could, you you could tell that she was a real uh, academic, you know. She just had that look now, or anyway, like you know. Can't judge a book by its cover. Oh, totally, yeah. Never judge a book by its cover, but like, but you can't not. It's just human. The, that was the first impression that I was making in my brain anyway. So, so, um, so I think I, I think I met with her first anyway, and I was praying, oh, please, please don't be my therapy uh, with this lady anyway. But uh, then she, she put me with a SLT student that I had was working with my child. And I have to say she was, she was really nice. She was more pleasing on the on the oil, so it's kind of so, uh, so yeah, I was happy enough to be going to my therapy session there anyway. So, um, so besides uh, escaping the intercom and moving from the intensive academic type to the more pleasant looking student, what was the nature? What do you remember as some, you know, some connections there or something that felt fitting or that didn't? Yeah. So we would have talked about. I'm just interested how earlier on the tapes just stayed in the bag. They never got out of the bag, the, the, the yeah. practice tapes that you were expected to do. So you'd come back to therapy and you hadn't touched that. 
in this engagement, how old are you now? This is uh, 16, 15, 16. Yeah. Different so, age, different stage, different stuff. So, yeah. yeah. So basically, there would have been two different parts for us. So we would have had uh, individual sessions and then we would have uh, broken into a group uh, just with different, different people who stuttered then. So um, what, I, what I remember from the individual sessions was really just walking on the slow feet and so on. So just on the, on the, mm, more, more, more tonics of the speech there. Um, the group work, I think, no, I don't really remember touching on any of the, any of the, the, the emotional side of the stuttering or how, how we felt. Um, but I think that might have been discussed, but it it didn't really stay in my memory anyway but um so i don't know whether there was much of a discussion around how we felt about distortion rather than just walking on the um, speech side of things anyway so so yes yeah, so that's my memory from my my therapy as a teenager so was that helpful would you you look back at that as 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 fitting or was it a it wasn't what it wasn't as as fitting for you given your age and what you were looking for yeah i don't think it was as fitting because maybe i wasn't ready to delve into how i felt about my stuttering at that stage even 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 if it was this ghost um, in a small bit like and i wasn't and I wasn't ready to put the effort in to do the fluency shape and stuff either, because that, because that would have taken like a lot of time and a lot of practice, and I just felt it wasn't right for me or really. Could we hang on this for a second? Because I think this is a paradox and irony. Can we hang yeah. on this stage? Is that okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'm gonna let you uh, take it where you wish. So you're 15, 16 years old, and here you are today with all the perspective and everything, and we'll get to that, and we'll talk about that you have a very, um, you do have a positive attitude towards the value and place of professional speech therapy. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on that, I think. You also certainly have dedicated yourself and have benefited from the world of self-help and the world of support that exists outside of the professional space, but just people who stutter, helping people who stutter and offering community and space that you're not alone. Um, so you also, and you also appreciate, I think, I um, uh, don't put words in your mouth, the, the space to explore the thoughts and the feelings and the importance of that in a stuttering journey, as well as uh, strategies. It's not to say that strategies don't have a place in the journey, but there's room, am I, am I right? Speaking correct? So I think it's so interesting. Am I right? I don't wanna. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally right. Uh, so once those are there, this is where my question lead up and then I'll, I'll pass it. So here you are 15, 16 years old. They're doing the mechanical stuff. It's not that it wasn't something you necessarily uh, think was good, but it wasn't, you, at 15, 16, you weren't ready to do that kind of work. And on the other hand, you're saying like, even if they had done a lot of the like cognitive emotional stuff, I don't think I really wanted to talk about feelings and stuff like that either. So I'm thinking with teenagers, there's this conundrum. They might not want to do the hard work of the mechanical practice and, and behavioral shifts and what that entails. They need, and they might want that. They say they want that, but they might not be ready to do the work. They definitely have thoughts and feelings, but they might not be ready to unpack that. And there can be a way to make it easier or harder to do that, but some just don't want to talk about it. So thinking back, what would you have wanted? What were you ready for? What would have been the ideal thing to meet Stephen at 16? You know, coming in that room, what would you have wished for? I think if I had met maybe, maybe a combination of, if I had met somebody older that stutters and that maybe has a positive out view on stutter and maybe that is like stuttering openly in front of me without much struggle. 
in combination with a therapist then that is able to show me the likes of um, from an SLT's point of view and being able to have that therapeutic uh, approach. I, I think that would have benefited me just being able to say, okay, look, I can see this chap now and he's a few years older than, than me. And even though he's still stuttering, but he's stuttering in a different way to the fact that I'm stuttering and, and I'm not seeing the like struggle or you don't see the avoidance that he is doing. So maybe there's a maybe there's a chance for me to get to that stage. So yeah. So maybe it's a combination you already think. So. I love it. And I just hope and I wanna bless you and, and ask anyone that's listening, use this recording, this video for that teen that you might be meeting or that teen you might know so that they could meet Stephen Green as such a person, as such an old, you know, example of someone a little bit further on in the years. And I'm sure Steve would be welcome, would welcome people contacting him to be a, a mentor or to zoom into a, a meeting with a young person who stutters. But I think that's a beautiful recommendation, Stephen, one that I, one that I support and practice, but I think it's important because it's out of the box, right? It, it's not one or the other. It's like this fusion of role models and mentors uh, of people that you would look up to who are stuttering openly and living fully and can give a, a feeling of confidence and of hope and of mentorship from standing in your shoes and getting it and then a professional who also needs to get it but might be able to contribute something therapeutic as well i think it's beautiful yeah yeah you like you it's all about it's about a collaboration really it's a collaboration um on many different fronts. So you have your speech and language therapist, you have the peer support. So the peer support might be um, might be kids who still are around the same age, then that they can feed off that energy from each other. It, it might be from like an older peer, uh, peer uh, group then as well. So, you know, so it's uh, just looking at the right combination. But it really goes back down to person centered. So it goes back down to the individual that is seeking the therapy. So uh, so you may have something that works for somebody and then that's not necessarily the right path for somebody else. So I think the therapist, the families and everyone, all of the stakeholders really need to put the individual at any of the decisions that are being made. So um, when it comes to therapy, when it comes to talking about or stuttering is that the individual really, so it's a person-centered approach really to, to, um, to dealing with stuttering. So. You know, it's funny, I'm just glancing at the comments. You've got your fan club. I don't see your mom commenting yet. If she's here, I'm looking for the comments. <laughs> okay. I don't think she's on Facebook, but... Uh, but Anita is here from Sweden and Trudy from the UK. And I see Trudy's question was in line with what I asked you about what would your five, five year old self, what was your experience in that space? And Anita saying without mentors and role models, like you just described Stephen, she wouldn't be where she is today. The importance of, of mentorship for young people, you know, and especially in the work that you do, you know this and in your volunteer work, I don't want to. I, I don't want to finish this without you getting a chance to talk about the Irish Stammering Association and mm. your work there. So please take it at any pace that you want to, but the mic is yours. Yeah. I just want to get to your bullet points. Cool. Yeah, maybe uh, because I think, I think an important part of my journey is maybe going from a person who was uh, avoiding stuttering, uh, all odds, uh, trying to avoid stuttering, um, to attending a support group and then looking into therapy options, uh, found a therapy program and ended up running this so report group after the therapy program, got involved with the ISA and became the chair of the ISA then. So it's a, maybe that journey, Yuri, then that, that I went on. And so I think it just rolls into maybe the tour time that I went for. So I would have been, um, 
I think it was 29, 20 or something, or maybe 21 years old. And I had started attending the Dublin so 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 report group about five or six months prior to going on the therapy program. And going to this this so report group, it just opened my eyes. I met other people who stuttered. I found that here's the report that we talked about, like you know, it's just just meeting other adults who stuttered, sharing our experiences. It was such a valuable thing for me. So that was the gateway for me to look into where I was going on my stuttering journey. So, so I was attending the support group for about five or six months. And then I heard about a therapy program. It was called, it was called DAS which stood for Dublin Adult Stuttering, which was run by, uh, it was run by the health board. So just uh, uh, the National um, Health Service of Ireland. And it was a seven day residential um, therapy course. So uh, that was run by three speech and language therapists that had, that had the um, recognized um, qualification in stuttering and I have to say that this course just it just it kind of blew my mind you know anyway like it just um now number one the fact it was kind of residential so it was a seven day residential course in a hotel just just on the outskirts of Dublin and so we just felt that we were in this big speech bubble and it was just everything was all about stuttering. And so I think there was, there was about seven or eight people that were on the course and the three speech and language therapists. And I suppose the background to the course, it was, it was all about uh, being open about your stuttering and uh, non-avoidance. Uh, uh, approach like you know so it was based on really based on the principles of um dr joseph sheen and charles van Ruyper. just a quick plug not for anyone but stephen green if you want to see beautiful excerpts from van Ruyper and sheen just follow stephen green on social he posts beautiful excerpts from his favorite teachers yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sheen and Van Ruyper are my stuttering gods anyway. So, okay. so and I remember even the first night on the course, like, um, we're all sitting around as a group and you can see the different faces and so many different personalities. People were so hung up about our stuttering and But even over the seven days, just getting to know these people and then we're all moving at different stages of the process of the therapy. But the, I found the kind of group, like the group work was so valuable. It was just an essential part of the therapy as well. Like so, and so we would have done um we actually got to watch videos in the evening time. So we watched the Van Ruyper Therapy in Action uh, video with um, Jeff, I think, wasn't it? Jeff, I, can't, I can't, can't think for a second name, but it was, it was just um, Van Ruyper doing his thing and seeing the passion of the man, like the passion that he had for for helping, for just wanting to help this guy to just, just to be at peace just with his stuttering and to be able to be open about his stuttering. And then, so watching the Van Ruyper videos and then, so like we would, we would watch, we would watch some of the video and we'd have a talk as a group then and just talk about um, how, how uh, we felt about the videos then. And it was the same for the Sheen stuff then. And 
I have to say that the Sheen stuff just kind of blew my mind totally because like Sheen was talking about um, like your stuttering doesn't hurt you. Uh, your fluency doesn't do you any good. So I, I, this guy was telling me that like my stuttering doesn't hurt me and that my fluency won't do me any good. That was like, that just kind of blew my mind at the time. Can you unpack that? Because I know you shared that and not everybody understood. It's not, there's a lot there in those few words, yeah. but if maybe you could share what that means to you, because I, I know what it means to me. I yeah. think I know what it means to you, but I don't know if everybody connects the dots okay. the way that you're intending. So if you could share a little bit, yeah. that could be very powerful. And also so just for context, yeah. Sheehan, Dr. Joseph Sheehan and Charles Van Riper are two of the pillars of the giants of the early phases of stuttering therapy. And um, the, the amazing thing about that era and the foundations of the professional uh, interests and dedication and devotion to helping people who stutter was started by and led by uh, uh, mostly men who stutter, uh, which is amazing when you think about it uh, and continue to stutter into their adult life and had different phases and iterations of their writing and of their work and of their storytelling. But they are definitely the people who blaze the path for all of us. But it is interesting. We think only recently of the idea of therapists who are also people who stutter. It's important to remember that the foundations of the entire profession are built on the shoulders of a lot of people who stutter, uh, overwhelmingly so. Yeah. So basically your stuttering doesn't hurt you. Um, what that means to me is that even just think back like what used to hurt me about my stuttering was everything I did to try not to stutter. So everything I did to try and hold back my stuttering, the avoidance behaviors, to try not to be open about my stuttering. That is what hurt me. Not the actually the, 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 the stuttering on the words. Like that is okay now. Like so like that's fine. So so that's what it means because like I think a lot of people maybe pick it up that the stuttering is just um, maybe all of the struggle that they're having uh, around our stuttering and so on. Whereas a lot of that struggle is everything we are trying to do just not to stutter. So um, I think that's what she means by that your stuttering doesn't hurt you. It's everything you do to try not to stutter that is hurting you. So, um, and your on fluency, the side. And on the other side, so your fluency uh, doesn't do you any good. So what he means is that if you're in a false state of fluency, so you're so you you are trying to be fluent at all costs. So you're maybe using all your tricks, uh, your substituting words, your uh, avoiding words, and you're trying to nail this fluency. And uh, like that is no good for you as a person who stutters because it's a false sense of fluency. And it's also if if you have the mindset, um, I I want to be fluent at all costs. Like where like where is where is your true or authentic self? just being shown then. So if you try to be fluent at all costs, what happens when you do stutter? So what happens at that moment when you get a block? So 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 does everything kind of start to fall down at, at, at that stage, you know? Whereas if you can see a fluency, I'd, I, I think I said it recently then, I was saying that my stuttering and my fluency are just part of the way I communicate now. So one of them doesn't have a step up on the other. Um, I see them as just parts of how I communicate. It's part of the overall picture of how I communicate. So, or if I was striving to be fluent the whole time, 
that would have an impact on myself as a person who stutters. So, so I, I think that's what she means by your fluency doesn't do you any good. If I explain it right there, <laughs> if I was if I was my own um, listener, I would put that one in the comments as the most inspiring, noteworthy takeaway right there, Stephen. That that was worth our entire friendship the last three minutes. So I encourage anyone that is listening, please add because Stephen is just a highlight reel. Not to mention, I'll add one other thing because Stephen's on. I'll just say I love listening to you. Cool, cool. You could, you could talk all day, and I would I would listen attentively. And the stuttering is woven in there, and so is the Irish accent, and it's a beautiful blended Scotch. And I know it would be an Irish whiskey, but but it's a blended Scotch. And the point is that in the end of the day, the words, the message, the connection, and the delivery all become something greater than any one of the parts. And so as a listener. Cool. I just share that. Yeah. Well, uh, we Irish, we do love to talk anyway. So we do. Can I, Listen, can I just Jews, share? Irish and Jews, we got a lot in common. You yeah, can yeah, share, yeah. you can talk all you want, 100%. Just don't answer cool, questions cool. with questions because then you'll really be Jewish. Yeah, yeah. Can I just add, right, just, just another quote of Sheen that I just want to throw out there just to people because this is just beautiful. It's right. Um, you don't have a choice as to whether you stutter, but you do have a choice as to how you stutter. And I think that's like that big because if you are stuttering into adulthood, the chance of you stuttering for the rest of your life is pretty high anyway. So you don't really have a choice as to whether or not you do stutter, but you have a choice as to how you stutter. So, I think that's very important for people to just try and get their minds uh, around that and to be able to say, oh, okay, because there's some because people do feel helpless that oh, look, I am never going to I am never going to get rid of this daughter and like what am I going to do? So if you don't have a choice that you're Hey, if you can say, right, well, I'm never going to get rid of it, but like, can I change the way that I stutter? Can I stutter without, can I stutter with confidence? Can I maintain eye contact with somebody when I'm talking to them? Um, can I maybe lessen the struggle of when I feel a block coming on? Or like, so, because you can still be a very good communicator. Like you can, you can still hold a room as a person who stutters, right? Yeah. And then you're met- holding the world right now. You're holding the world. You got loves and likes flowing in from around the world. You're walking evidence of this. It doesn't need to be said. It's unspoken because you're an embodiment of it. And it's people like you that are my heroes of courage and strength and fortitude and such examples for others who are in that place where it seems so impossible it feels so overwhelming and it feels like they don't have agency they don't have choice and what you're saying the words are just overshadowed by your being Stephen. yeah well you and if it's okay can i just take this time to just thank a few people as well because um just to kind of give back as well so i really want to thank all of the people i've met during this so the uh, peers or so report uh, movement so people that have met through the, the self-help groups um fellow people who start or people that i've been on my therapy program with and i've got in touch with a good few of them and um they just bring joy in into my life also and also a big shout out to the speech and language therapist that worked with myself on my stuttering so there was three speech language therapists and their, I think their passion for helping people who start us. So a big thank you to Jonathan, uh, Donna and, um, oh, 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 oh my God, it's actually her name has gone out of my head, but um, she actually knows who, um, Noreen, Noreen. So a big thank you to uh, Noreen, Donna and Jonathan. Um, 
and so yeah so because and I, I I think it's a very I think it's very important to say thank you to our people as well like you know once you've once you've managed to maybe uh, once you've managed to get somewhere or you've managed to find something that has worked for you as a person who's taught us I think it's important to just say thank you and to maybe pass on pass on some of that goodness that has been passed on to you guys as well. Like this, so. That is such a theme that has shown through these conversations, the importance of somebody opened the door for us in our journey and the importance of, and the delight, the responsibility and also the delight to pay it forward and, and pass it forward. It doesn't cost a thing. You only, you, you gain more from it. Uh, you know, on the one hand, we're coming up to the top of the hour. On the other hand, far be it for me to, to cap this off too soon. So any, any, other, any other important messages and words of wisdom, and then we can certainly do this another round. But for this round, uh, I'm enjoying immensely, and I'm going to enjoy listening to this again. I know people are enjoying. If you've got a takeaway, please jot it down in the comments. We'll, we'll make it post-worthy on social. You can check it out at schneiderspeech.com. Um, but yeah, just to give you an opportunity to share another another little bit. Yeah, I just want um I suppose just kind of coming up to the end. Um just to just to let people know that the right help is out there. And uh so whether it be speech and language services, speech and language therapist or pathologist, um and the stuttering community group also so um, I would encourage people to take action because I I think one of the biggest things for people who stutter is maybe the fear is holding back so like that stops them from taking action from, from making that four steps and making the four step to get in touch with your local chapter or, or um go online and join a Facebook group for people who stutter or um, just get in touch with a speech and language therapist. The help is out there and, um, and the support is out there as well. So from your fellow people who stutter and from the professionals also, you know. So just tell people to reach out because they the community is is there and the right help is out there also anyway. So, so. it's like we could add to, to Sheehan's quote another piece like if you're lost trying to get yourself found ain't gonna do you any good you know finding help and knowing that there's help out there both other people who stutter in a in a self-help space individuals online locally around the world professionals, there are good professionals out there, just knowing you don't have to figure this out alone. You're not alone. You're not the only person. Uh, and that there are people out there that want to help from yeah. every which way. Um, yeah. Stephen, let's go to one controversial. Oh, go ahead. And then I, yeah. I was going to go ahead, queue up one controversial thing before we finish. Oh, sorry. Um, so you are just to lead on that last thing that you said. So just what Sheen said as well was, he says, there's many roads that lead to Rome and to and from so there's many roads to and from Stuttering. So like people just have to take the action. So cool. that's right. There are many cool. roads, and uh, not all the gates are locked. You know, you might knock on a door and the intercom holds you back, or you might go and the cost is too high, or you might think the schedule of the local meeting doesn't fit your work life or your personal life. There are roads that might work for you, where the the toll won't hold you back and the timing might be right. So just keep searching, you know, if at first you do not succeed in finding what you need, just keep looking because you'll find it. Um, yeah. The seekers, the seekers become seers. That's the line I heard from Kristen Camilla. Um, so controversial, a yeah. quick, a quick riff on this. I know Ooh. that we first connected. Yeah, there you go. Now we're going to really go for it. You know, we both, uh, we connected over observing, um, conversations on social media in communities for people who stutter 
and privately we connected about things that were concerning to us. Um, and I was wondering if you want to just share on the one hand, obviously a world that's more connected where communities can come together. And I'm speaking as a father, you know, whether it's things I'm dealing with personally or for my own kids, nothing to do with my work, nothing to do with stuttering. I'm grateful that there are communities I can go to to learn more about things that other people are going through in other parts of the world. It makes me smarter. It makes me feel like I'm not alone. It makes me feel like I have audience and connection with a whole peer group. And it just feels like a, a safety net, encouragement, support, information, et cetera. And at the same time, as a professional, I always tell people, don't keep turning to Dr. Google because Dr. Google is not always gonna give you the best way forward or the best information. So too, in no way to knock the benefits of social media groups and conversations at the same time to be cognizant, what are some of the risks or some of the things that concern you from where you're coming from? Any guardrails or thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I suppose because just being on the stuttering, uh, the stuttering groups. Don't name last, names. Yeah, yeah, no names of yeah, any no, specific groups. Stuttering groups from the last few months. And I suppose like this isn't like, if you think about it, this isn't a new thing either, because if you think back to, uh, I remember going online back in 2005, and the, I think you probably know a particular group that was present at the time, but like these conversations were happening back then on the internet anyway. And I think it was, Similar things were happening. So you would have a lot of value that was happening on these groups, but also you would have a lot of um, misinformation also. So uh, information that was plainly wrong about stuttering uh, being said on these groups. Um, now, I can see that the, uh, people will challenge the information that is put out there. Um, but you will have other people that will reinforce maybe the misinformation that is kind of put out there also. So is it the role of the person who stutters to be able to disconcern uh, like, um, like what is the right information and then what isn't the right in, in information so so i suppose one of the challenges is to to keep it a safe space for people who suffer so you so you might have somebody that's quite vulnerable that they're not coming on maybe they're not feeling great about their stuttering and how can we as a group of people who add who advocate for people who stutter keep these forms a safe space for um, for the, the discussions then that happen then as well. So so I uh, think that's uh, one thing to you know, obviously groups have um, moderators and uh, so on, but also like um, people have kind of busy lives, so they can't be on on line twenty. 24 7 to be checking up the content that is up there as well like so so i think these groups they do have value to them and there's some very valuable people that are sharing that are sharing some great egg experience and um uh, about stuttering but also on the other hand there is quite a lot of misinformation that is out there and that is reinforced by different people. So how can we as a stuttering community be able to move this forward? I don't, I don't want to add much, but I think uh, I love what you said. It's not a new problem. Um, how do we make sure to leverage all the benefits and mitigate as much of the risk and as much of the harm that could come out inadvertently, unintentionally. I think we're living in an exciting time, but the size of these groups is probably dwarfing previous, the existing groups, even just 10, 20 years ago by a factor of 10X or more. Um, so there's an incredible connectivity opportunity, but also you know, more 
more of a vocal minority and, and so on. So I think the activation of the community in some way, the same you would do in a school classroom, you know, to create a culture that, uh, that adheres and activates not just the initial moderators. And by the way, a shout out to any and all people who are involved in these spaces as members, as participants, as the ad admins are just astounding people. Many of them are people I know and some of them are people I don't, but power to you to do this. But yeah, I think I think the importance of, of somehow figuring out how do you become citizens of the cyber world and recognize some of the opportunity and responsibility uh, that comes with it, the privileges and also the responsibility and meeting people where they're at. Misinformation is one thing, fake news, let's say. Uh, but then there's also just hitting someone with truth that might be truth for you or truth for someone else at a different stage, but it's not the right truth to hit them with at that moment. And it could be true as, as, as Stephen is Irish and I'm Jewish, but it might not be the truth that they uh, can hold at that moment. And so how to, how to meet people where they're at, when they're at it. And then also you know, like people might be overzealous in a certain approach or a certain ideology when it comes to stuff. And, Whereas they lose the context of I'm different to you and you're different to him. So maybe what I see as the best thing ever when it comes to stuttering, maybe in another person or is that isn't that isn't the right thing, or maybe the right time for them. They're just the stuff that you were just talking about. So. Well, this has been even more awesome than expected, which is to say a lot. Um, sure. I want to thank you, Stephen, for this, uh, taking the time and the openness. And I trust that you'll go through all the comments. You have lots and lots of fans, maybe even a tribe of people that are sending their, uh, their loves, their shout outs, their appreciation, their respect, and their encouragement. Um, and for me, I leave today just a little bit more inspired, a little bit more informed. And I'm gonna go practice my Irish accent again because I'm I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, in the we, name of the Father. As we say in in Dublin, your sound a sound. Michael Ryan was here. He said he had to get back to work. He had to, uh, but serious, whatever that line was. Uh, he had to get back to work, but he gave you a shout out for anybody who's interested. Uh, There'll be some more announcements, but you can check out uh, on social media, Schneider Speech on Instagram, on, on Facebook, some exciting opportunities for speech therapists to go further to learn how to transcend stuttering and now get you know, the highest level of CEUs and lots of them. So share that in your communities if you know people, either privately or publicly, and opportunities for people who stutter to just get some free resources and tips and insights to find your way and to find your community. And the one thought I wanted to leave with everything we opened up there, if you've had a bad experience or a less than desirable experience in any community in person or any therapy experience or any support community online, uh, as, as Stephen said, there are many roads to Rome. So uh, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, know that it's not a good space for you or not a good fit for you, whatever that is, get away from it. But you might find that another place has a different culture, a different vibe, a different thrust. So um, there's a place for everybody in this world. And there's support out there. No one should feel alone. There shouldn't be a barrier that holds anyone back and makes anyone feel isolated. And Stephen's there to make sure of it. And I'm sure we're going to have many more opportunities. Did you want to share one more? Take away. Um, Send off. Yeah, just to say, um, just keep moving forward, people. Keep moving forward. And we have this. We'll leave off there. Thank you so much, Stephen Green. And thank you, everybody who joined us. Share this. It's worth sharing. People love it. And thank you for coming. We can't do this without you. So you can check it out on any podcast platform, Transcending Stuttering. Subscribe, like, drop a review. It means a lot. and It helps us reach more people.